Should I start? I mean, for me, it's two minutes early, but if you want me to start, I can start talking with you until other people show up. Do you want me to start? Like, big round of applause if you want me to start. Just shut up if you want me to wait one more minute. And now, how do I distinguish the one that shut up and the one who applauded? Like, I don't really hear the difference. Um, anyway, so my name is Elizabeth Mara. Uh, I'm the CEO of Abiding Bridge. Before doing that, uh, I worked on social impact games, a normal lost phone, and another lost phone, Laura Stories. Um, so yeah, those games. Uh, is there anyone in the room that played them? Okay, that's good. Uh, other people, uh, just let you know, there will be a lot of spoilers. So if you want, you can leave now to go to another conference. That's your time. Uh, and I will repeat it another time for the other people that are coming in. Uh, for people who don't know about those games, so it's a game where you found a phone and you have to find out what happened to the owner of the phone by looking through uh, the messages, uh, looking to the gallery, find passwords, investigative game. Um, okay, more people coming. Hey, come on in. Welcome. Hi. Uh, so I'm going to show you uh, the trailer of the first game because the trailer of the second game looks a lot like the first one, so it's not going to be interesting to show you both. Um, yeah, so you found a phone. What if you found a phone? Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> oh, would you look through it? Well, you receive four messages from Dad, except. Da, 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 da. What story will you find in? Pictures. Uh -uh. Motorcycle. Board games. <gasps> Ooh. Applications. Oh no, passwords. That's not the right password. <laughs> hey, lovebird. Ooh. Ooh. Hi, Susie. Text messages. Where are you? Everyone is looking for you. Where did you go? We are really worried. Tell us everything is fine. Your mom wants to call the police. Dad, what secrets would you unveil? Da -da -da. Secrets. A normal lost phone. You have just found a phone. Now find out the truth. I like showing uh, this video without any sound because I like make silly jokes about it. And I'm sorry if it was not good ones. Um, so as I say, another lost phone, same concept as a normal lost phone. Both game, you found a phone. And now I'm, it's the part where I'm gonna do uh, some huge spoilers about what this game is about. Uh, so if you want to leave again, that's your moment. By the way, if you haven't played this game for now, like they've been released for two years, so it's on you. Uh, they have even have been free for uh, some time, so like, what are you waiting for? Half-Life 3 to go out? Um, so yeah, in the first game, um, what we really do is we present the game as a mystery game, but actually it's about uh, LGBT rights uh, and uh, LGBT phobia, so homophobia, transphobia, biphobia, all these great things that we love. Um, I don't. Uh, so the idea is that you discover the phone of this main character called Sam, and at the beginning you believe uh, Sam is for Samuel and his boy, and you discover that he has maybe some issues with his friends at school, and he has an uncle, and he likes uh, board games, and he looks fun, and you, you start to get attached to this character, and then you discover that actually it's, it's not Sam Samuel, it's Sam Samira, and she's a trans girl, trans bisexual girl, uh, and it's too late, you already like this character. So uh, you, you, form a, you, you got budded with this character. Um, and the second game, so another Lost and Lower Stories, is about domestic issue, uh, violence and abusive relationships, so another great topic. Also the same, you discover the life of Laura, and you discover what it's like to not really know who you can trust or who you can't trust. Um, 
so yeah, we this game had a real impact, and we received a lot of messages from players showing that the impact was, in fact, very real. So this is one message we, that we got a lot. This game helped me come out of the closet. Cool. This game made me realize that I was homophobic and that I had to change. Nice thing to do, to read. This game has helped me accept my past. That was about the second game. This game made me realize that I was too jealous and I had to work on it. I don't know about you, but I was very happy to see all these messages. Like, that's basically why I make video games. It's to have impact on people's life. Uh, I don't know why you're in video games. I guess it's not for the money. It's not for the non-mandatory crunch. Um, so yeah, that's what I call direct social impact. You make a game to deliver a message and the people, they change their mind at the end. It's not the same as indirect social impact. And before I talk to you about direct social impact and how to do it, I would like to give you some notes about indirect social impact. Indirect social impact is the idea that every work, every creation, everything we do has an impact on its audience, whether we want it or not. For example, I'm sorry, I'm going to be very, telling a very specific story about my life very boring one. Uh, when I was a teenager, I read a lot of mangas. Anyone was reading a lot of mangas too? Yeah. So I was reading two kinds of mangas. On one side, I was reading a lot of shoujo's, mangas for girls. Yeah. And uh, in all those mangas, I always saw uh, girls trying to find Prince Charming and the best way to satisfy him. Oh. Takumi-san, I love you. I made you an omelette. Oh, Takumi-san, I love you. Please, uh, let me draw a picture of your face with ketchup on the omelette. You're like, stop treating your boyfriend like he's your child. It's not a good relationship. So, yeah. Looking for Prince Charming was something important. The other kind of mangas that I was reading was shonen's, mangas for boys. And all the boys in it, uh, well, they were real sex maniacs. Like, they were obsessed about getting laid with their best friend, with their other friends, with their worst enemy, uh, to lose their virginity. Sex was, like, the thing. I was really young, and I really didn't have a lot of perspective yet. So, uh, when I started my adult life, I had two beliefs. First, that uh, my role was to find Prince Charming, because that's what I've read in the shows. And the second thing is that Prince Charming will be a uh, sex obsessed, uh, a real sex maniac, because all boys are. And since my role was to satisfy him, I had to do whatever he would ask for me. For me. So yeah, I, uh, uh, that's sad because it re really wasn't the best way to start young adult life, but that was my story. And what I'm trying to say is not that mangas are evil and that I regret having read them. Not at all. They were good mangas and I learned a lot of interesting stuff thanks to them and I love mangas still. What I'm saying is that I'm not sure that the authors of these mangas, while living in Japan, were thinking about the impact that uh, their work could have on a French teenage girl living really far from them. So that's what I'm trying to say here. Um, every game is political, every work we do has an impact, and our responsibility as authors is not a choice. Sorry. Uh, you cannot say, uh, my game is not about politics. You can say that, it's just, yeah, your game will impact people, I'm sorry. Uh, nice photograph lady. Um, So yeah, your games will have impact on people. So it means that you have to make at least inclusive games. What is inclusive games? Inclusive games are games where you try to have the less negative impact you could have. It means that each time you take a decision, 
you take the time to reflect on this decision and try to think, will this creative de decision would have an impact on other people? Would it impact negatively? Can I change it? And it's the idea that, like, um, take responsibility for the choices you make. Okay, you decided to have a game with only uh, white people. If there's a good reason for that, okay, but don't do it because you forgot that there are other uh, people in the world. Um, making an inclusive game is not the same as making an activist game. Activist game is like when you try on purpose to change people's minds on a topic. Inclusive games is the minimum you should do. Activist game is something that you shouldn't feel compelled to do because it's really risky, both militantly and commercially. It's commercially risky because, let's face it, some people don't want to play uh, political activist games, so if you try to make those games, uh, you will hinder some of your earnings. And it's militantly risky because it's actually quite hard to do a good game, and it's even harder to make a good game that also has a real impact on, on your players. So what I'm trying to do is give you some tips uh, and lesson learned from the making of a normal lost phone and another, another lost phone. And um, I hope these tips will help you. So first thing, uh, in normal lost phone and another lost phone, you don't incarnate another character. You know how in most games you are asked to play someone else? In normal Lost Phone, that's not the case in the Lost Phone series. Like, you found a phone. Like, I, Elizabeth, I found a phone on the floor. What do I do with it? The player is just a witness. He has to read uh, what happened to the owner of the phone before him. He doesn't, uh, the players don't have to make choices instead of the protagonist. Uh, they just have to understand why it makes them choose between two options. It's not like, oh, should I save my best friend or should I save the city? I don't like both of these options, what do I do? It's like, okay, this other character that is not me has made these choices, this choice, I not agree with it, but I understand why, what made them do it. Uh, so that was an interesting way of designing this game. I'm not saying that all direct social impact games should do the same, but it was uh, a new way of... Uh, interacting with the players. But also, uh, this mechanic had some failures, uh, especially in the first game. So we had one thing called the unsent draft mechanic. You don't have to read all the text. The idea is that at some point during the game, uh, you will come across some messages that have not been sent by the character, and you can send these messages and then you get an answer from other characters and that helps you move on with the story. And at the time it looked like a really good idea to have more interactivity. And it was not a good idea. Uh, actually a lot of players didn't like it because it felt like too much of an invasion, invasion of privacy. And it, it looked like it was okay to interfere with someone's life and pretend to be them and send messages to other people. It is not okay. And that's like a negative impact that we are not uh, think about. Also, uh, people from the LGBT uh, community, like they really did not like it also because they already have to face a lot of invasion of privacy. Uh, for example, people are asking, uh, okay, so how exactly is the sex with your partner? Or, okay, what do you have uh, between your legs? That's not people you use, that's not question that you usually ask for to people, uh, to your friends. So why do you ask it to LGBT people? Um, so yeah, we realized it was a very bad idea. And also one thing uh, that was weird is that we did make a lot of playtests on the game. And none of the players uh, who tested the game told us before, y you know that's bad. And I think one of the reasons that nobody told us that it was bad is uh, that all the people who played the game, there were people who knew us directly or indirectly, and they always knew what were our intentions. 
And since they knew that our intentions were good, well, they didn't think about the ne negative impact uh, this decision could have. So I play test with more people and people who don't know. Um, so we had to correct this in the second game in another lost phone. So one thing that we did is have a warning at the beginning of the game. The story of this phone is fictional, but the events described here are realistic and based on actual events. Searching through the content of another person's phone is a violation of the honor of privacy. You are about to enter the private life of a fictional character but do not repeat this action in situations outside the parameters of the game without the consent of the people involved. You know how silly it felt to have to add this warning? I mean, do you play FPS games? Uh, yeah, some of you. Have you ever seen a warning saying at the beginning, actually, killing people is bad, don't do it in real life? No. But the thing is, uh, looking into someone else's phone is something that a lot of people actually do. And we had to put this message in the game in order not to trivialize it. Quick survey. Can you raise your hand if you have never, never, never looked into someone else's phone? OK, that's like really not the majority. Uh, all the people who raise your, their hands, be sure you have a password on your phone because other people will look onto your phone. Um, so yeah, uh, the other thing that we made as a change is not to put an unsend draft mechanic in the second game because guess what? There were other ways to uh, make the story move forward. So we just had to think about them, and it was not that hard. And uh, the last thing we made is that there are different endings in the game. And one of the possible endings is actually to uh, open the game, start it, and then erase all the data from the phone and not search through it at all. And there's even an achievement for that, because like, it's a noble way to play the game to not want to play it. And uh, our speedrun, speedrunners are really, really fast. Um, another advice I would like to give you is to choose your battles. You want to change the world. Well, I guess, I guess you are, and I guess that's why you're here. Please raise your hand if you want to change the world. Okay. Not that much people, I'm sad. Uh, but maybe at the end of the talk there will be more. Uh, so, you want to change the world, some of you at least. It's great, I congratulate you. Uh, but let me say that uh, you cannot expect that uh, thanks to your game you will open people's eyes on all topics. It doesn't work that way. Uh, think as activism as glasses. If you give uh, someone who is not used to glasses, uh, a pair of glasses with a very light correction, they will be... Uh, troubled at first, but they will, it will take them a little time to adjust and then they will be, oh great, I have new glasses and now I see the world better. If instead of giving them this first pair of glasses, you give them at the beginning uh, glasses with very thick lenses, they will put them on their head and then they will realize it's giving them a headache and they will take it off. And activism is the same. You, you just cannot expect to, to people to open their eyes on everything at the same time. So what I advise, what I'm advising is to choose one topic that is really important for you. Uh, really do a lot of research, uh, do a lot of playtests to, sure, to be sure that uh, you are doing this topic right. And for all the other topics that are important to you, instead of having uh, uh, an activist angle, have an inclusive angle like what I said before. For example, in Anomalous Phone, we never talk about racism because it's a heavy topic and we're already talking about uh, transgender rights, so maybe not a good idea to add another topic to it. But we have an inclusive angle. We have a lot of different characters, uh, different origins for them, 
And at no time does any character that use a racist insult or make a racist joke, inclusive Engel. By the way, do you know uh, what's funny about racist jokes? Nothing. So yeah, uh, another thing is about uh, veganism. I'm personally, I'm vegan and animal exploitation is really a big topic for me. Uh, but I cannot just make all my games about it. So Sam, the main character, they have a character in the game who is vegan and she talks about it. And that's it. It's just someone in the background, uh, like giving a little anecdote. Uh, Sam has a friend who is vegan, like she, and she has another friend who likes board games. It's not the topic of the game. In another lost phone, uh, you can see a picture of stuffed zucchini in the gallery of Flora's, and you can also find the recipe in the notes. And uh, when you look at the recipe, it's not written anywhere that it's a vegan recipe. It just a stuffed zucchini is. You need onions, you need rice, you need zucchini, stuff, stuff, stuff. And um, some people play the game, and after that, they want to try the recipe. So they prepare the same recipe as in, as in the game. And they ate vegan food, so maybe I save one animal uh, indirectly with this game. Oh, sorry. Um, one more thing is that I would advise you to avoid moralizing gameplay. Uh, like you shouldn't say to anyone at any moment that they have to accept what you're saying in order to progress. Like they can have different views, it's fine. It's not like there's a quiz and oh, if you're still homophobic at this point, you cannot advance in the game. Also in the writing, we try not to be too Manichaean. Our characters uh, that we don't agree with on some topics, well, they have other qualities. Uh, like, the mom is maybe not so great on some points, but on the other side, the cakes are terrific. And I really love cakes. And I think that's really important, because if you want to make people change their mind, you have them make them feel not attacked by your game. And you have to show that you don't consider they are the bad people, the evil people, and uh, they could all just leave. Uh, playtest. For any game you make, it's always important to playtest. I hope you know that. I used to be a playtest uh, coordinator lab, so that's really important for me. So, But I'm not here to talk to you about uh, usability playtest right now. I want to talk with you about social impact playtest, which is not something you usually do, because you only do it if you want to test the social impact of your game. Uh, this means that you have to test your game with uh, different kind of audiences. People who are concerned about your topic, to see if you've written everything good, and people who are not concerned about your topic, uh, to see if they understand what you're trying to say. For example, in a normal lost phone, one of the very first playtests we did was someone who didn't know anything, uh, who was not from the LGBT community, and when he played, uh, we realized he didn't know what LGBT stands for. Like, we know it's for lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans. But for this guy, like, he had no idea. For him, it could be a kind of sandwich, like, uh, lettuce, guacamole, bacon, and tomatoes. And uh, w that was good, because it was really one of our first playtests, and it made us realize how important it will be to always taste the game with people who don't know about the topic, to always check if they understand. Also, we tested with people who are directly concerned, so people who from the LGBT community, and they also uh, gave very important feedback. For example, in a normal loss fund, there was a very big part of the game when, where we were talking about uh, suicide rates and murder rates of LGBT people. Great, yeah, uh, LGBT people get killed a lot. And we were told that maybe that's something that we should remove from the game because we were making a game for teenagers to have them come out and maybe telling them that they might get murdered if they come out was not the best way to encourage them to do so. So yeah, all part of the game that was removed. 
Anomalous Fawn was first created, created during a game jam, so only 48 hours of writing, and after that we had a prototype and we showed it to people. And uh, it was not the same process with another Lost Phone. And we wanted to have more, more time to do some research and think about what we were doing. So the first thing I did was reading a lot, uh, essays, scientific uh, papers, autobiographies, uh, anything I could find about a uh, toxic relationship. It was very fun months to read all of these things. And after that, uh, we went to a uh, special organization uh, that like support victim association group, this kind of thing. And uh, I came and I said, hey, we want to make a game about a uh, toxic relationship. Do you want to help us? And the first reaction were, was, no, absolutely not. Because it's, it's really hard to understand uh, for people that are doing some activist work that video games can be are something that is not only used for fun. So we had to explain them to them that, no, we, we can talk about serious subjects in video games. And the way to convince, her, to convince them was to show them uh, videos of famous YouTubers that, vid that did videos about the first game and to show them in the comment section that, oh, you see all the people that say they changed their mind about homophobia thanks to this game, you see? Like, uh, you could have a real impact if you help us uh, make, a, make a better game, so please. So they say, okay, we will help you. Um, the first thing we did with them is try to decide uh, which angle we will use for the story. Like, domestic, uh, toxic relationship, it's a lot of different things. It can be uh, a new family, it could be with parents, it could be with friends, co-workers, uh, not only like husband-wife dynamic. So we had to decide what do we want people to learn from this game. And uh, while talking with this organization, we realized that uh, the things that were, were the less understood by um, the majority of humanity is the way that the cycle of violence works. You can Google it after the conference, it's really interesting. Like, just remember cycle of violence. And uh, this cycle explains why uh, victims don't leave their abusers. And the other things that a lot of people didn't understand and still don't understand is how um, psychological violence always precedes physical violence and that actually uh, psychological violence is a form of violence and it's very important. So we decided that that was our goal to make people understand these things and make sure they understand it at the end of the game. So then what uh, uh, I created a, a synopsis, like a one page synopsis of Laura's story and I show it to them, saying, okay, that's, that's the story of our main character. What do you think about it? And they help us correct it. And we, uh, we went back and forth, and we changed a lot of things in it in order to avoid falling into cliché. After we did that, uh, I took the story and I wrote it once again, but this time uh, it would be like a walkthrough of the game. It was like, okay, we know what Laura's story is because we talked about it, but this is how the players are gonna find out about the story. And again, like, okay, this, no, this is not very good, blah, 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 you should change it. And it's only after we agreed on this playthrough that we start to write any line of the game. And that was really, really impactful because instead of having a long part of the game uh, talking about murder, rights of LGBT teens, and then after that, putting in it into the trash, it saved us a lot of time and a lot of energy because we knew from the beginning where we were going, and that's a good process. Uh, anyway, so that was my talk, and there's a lot of time for questions, so that's cool. Um, if there's a question that you don't feel uh, asking here publicly, uh, you can also research me or on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, whatever you want, and uh, ask me more privately after if you don't feel like asking any question now. Thank you very much.
Now, do we have any questions? Yeah. Okay. I hope it's not a hard one. Uh, also, I, I'm sorry in advance, like uh, my English listening skills are really bad, so I might ask you to repeat like about three times. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Th thank you for the talk. Um, I have a long question. Um, I subjectively treat uh, if you played Darkest Dungeon or heard about it, uh, it's a, like a roguelike game uh, about fantasy characters that dwell into dungeon and have it, like emotional stress about being there. Uh, as far as I know, it was never intended to be a social impact game, but it certainly had some. And my question is actually like, if you, if you have any advice to developer who makes a game with indirect uh, social impact, but I know it will be. Uh, and any advice about how to avoid like negative bombing from uh, like guys who are gonna treat this game as a social impact game, probably. Am I clear with this I question? I think so. Yeah, um... thank you. So I haven't played Darkest Dungeon, but I've played uh, Dead, Dead in Vinland, uh, which not the same game, but has some similarities. And actually, uh, Dead in Vinland is a game that really helped me uh, get better and uh, be less depressed because taking care of the character and the depression helped me realize that I had to take more care of myself. So. Uh, it's what I said before, every game is going to have an indirect social impact, all of them. So yeah, you should think about what you're doing and uh, how to avoid having a bad impact. Um, brainstorm your ideas, uh, talk with a lot of people, uh, inform yourself about social topics, uh, test, play test your game a lot. I play test your game a lot with a lot of people you don't know. Um, also, there are some groups of people who want to play test games uh, and say what's wrong with them. So if you can find these groups. Uh, like there's a lot of activists uh, all over the world that uh, want to to have less shitty games. Um, also, uh, consider uh, hiring and paying uh, a consultant, maybe someone who is an expert on this topic, because there are a lot of experts in on activist issues, and usually they are doing all their work for free. Uh, so, if you have any extra money, think about paying them. It's not an option. Like <laughs> any other question? Hello. Um, I'm curious about, so you said now the games, the two games are free, right? No. They're not? They're not. Okay. So, but I, actually, that's, so my question uh, it is... It was free for like, uh, uh, yeah. one of them was free for a week and that was a good time to play it if you didn't. Uh -huh. uh, I think that's when I played them actually, doesn't matter. But I, I'm, I'm interested in the, the thought process uh, that you had behind making a paid app for, for a game that has a social impact like there, I, I'm just assuming there's been some like, oh, if it's free, more people will play it, greater impact. Uh, well, how did you come to, to the, this, the decision behind uh, the, the pricing? And uh, Well, the thing is, if it's not free, it, mean, it means that there's going to be more money to make other social impact games. For sure. So, yeah, that's basically why it's not free. So there's not, we there's... want to make more games. But it's also why uh, there have been a lot of uh, sales uh, on it, like it's not something that is an issue uh, for me at least. Uh, and if people uh, pirate the game, that's cool too. Uh, if teachers ask for uh, educational version to play in the class, it's fine too. But yeah, uh, studios still need money to make more games. Of course, like yeah. it's not something that was, uh, you know, there, there are some social impact games that are paid directly by organization. For example, I, I don't know, we could have imagined uh, like the government asking us to make a game about uh, LGBT teenagers uh, because uh, there are issues uh, in high school about it. And they would have paid us to do it. That's not the case here. It's like we wanted to make a game, a social impact games. So 
at some point we have to put some food into your stomach. Definitely. Cool. Thanks. Is there any mic going on the second level too? Because I see there's like two levels. Uh, there's only one. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, yes. Hi. Pink hair rules. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hey, um, not actually a question, just wanted to thank you for the speech and the inspirations. It's uh, been really good to hear these topics. It's a really big topic and I think games has like very strong uh, power to like convey the message because of the interactivity. So thank you for inspirations and for doing this and keep it up. Thank you. And thank you for your future games. <laughs> Any other question? We still have nine minutes. You know how uh, at conferences there's always someone who say, well, I don't have a question, I have a remark, and then they talk about their life for 10 minutes, yeah. and everybody wants to kill them? <laughs> well, we have time for people asking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to do that, hopefully. Um, my question is, uh, I've uh, never made my uh, views open in, uh, in my studio, although everyone knows them because I'm pretty open about that stuff uh, outside of it. So whenever I make a statement concerning, uh, uh, you know, social openness and, 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 and stuff like that, it still sounds like uh, much of an agenda. And I was wondering how to approach that stuff to be less invasive than it sounds in my head all, <laughs> all the time. Uh. Why do you feel it would be a bad thing to be invasive? Uh, because I'm uh, employed as a specialist and all of the things I say are, or most of the things I say are considered law. So... <laughs> a what? Law. <laughs> okay, I love the law. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, I, I guess, yeah, the same thing as normal loss one and another loss one. Try to uh, make games that are funny because they're games and then talk about your topics in it instead of saying, oh, I want a game about, I'm, I, I will make a game about this topic. Yeah. Uh, does it help? I'm not sure. Not really. I don't have that much impact in, <laughs> in that, at least in the games I make in the studio in terms of the ones outside. Thank you. Any other question or remark? Anyone try to make an activist game? And want to talk about it? Um, I wanted to ask what are your expectations in regards to press coverage of games like that? I mean, what would you expect press to cover and what would you expect them to just leave out and then? not try to comment on their own? Um, actually, the press coverage of these two games was really, really good. Uh, I think uh, press liked that we did something different. Uh, that there are not so many social impact games out there, uh, especially not so many commercially, uh, like commercial uh, social impact games. So uh, yeah, the, the coverage was good and I think press is interested in to this kind of game. Also, we had a lot of uh, non-game press, like uh, Huffington Post or uh, Stylist magazine or stuff. Um, and, and that's pretty interesting as well. But do you feel that press can do you a disservice in some way by covering your game? I mean, including some of their own comments or approaching it from an angle that you really don't like? Um, there's one article that uh, spoiled the end of the game in the title, so that was not the best thing to do. Uh, especially that, like, the whole impact of uh, a normal lost one is that you don't know that some is a transgender girl. You have to think that she's a boy in order to understand and fully experience the game. So if you know before you start to play, so I'm sorry for all the spoilers, um, if you know it before, it's, it's really not the same game. So that's like the only thing that uh, I didn't like as press reaction. 
But uh, other than that, uh, well, sometimes they didn't like something in the game, and uh, for example, uh, didn't like the unfriend draft mechanic, and it was really important because it was very good criticism that we didn't realize and help us progress and make a better second game. So, uh, yeah, uh, I'll listen to the press too. One question over there. Thank you. I I would like to ask about um, about the playtesting. You said that you invited people that are maybe in favor of or like part of the LGBT, and some of them that are kind of neutral. But did you consider having people that maybe are not on the different side of spectrum? Because I guess that's the kind of audience you'd like to maybe convince of the or the change or change them. But I guess that might be a little bit. Um, dangerous. Uh, you mean people who are against? Yeah, maybe device? not really, not really against. Maybe, but really on the spectrum that are not convinced about uh, what you are trying to convey. Uh, Did you consider those those people as a playtester as well for your game? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We and it was actually the ones that were the most hard to find okay. because, like. Uh, Almost everyone in the team was from the LGBT community, so like you're going to your friends, and, oh, you're queer too. Fuck. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we did find some people uh, that uh, really uh, didn't even think about this topic, and yeah, we play tests with these people. All right, thank you. Does it answer your question? Um, well, because I, I was thinking more of a people that. Because you said you want to, you know, change the world, have a social impact. But if you play test on people that are already kind of support your ideas of what you want to <clears throat> convey uh, in your game, it might be like, you know, conven convincing people that already are convinced. Yeah, yeah, that's why we we tested mostly with people right. who were not convinced. Okay. Uh, also, I I forgot to describe the process. Uh, what we ask these people is to uh, play the game and then tell the story uh, with their own words, and uh, we try to find out uh, what they understood from the story by analyzing the words they were using. And that's how we saw if there was an impact or not. Uh, for example, when they were uh, saying, uh, uh, oh, Sam is bisexual and never uh, mentioning the fact that she's trans, uh, we were like, okay, so there's something that is not understood well here, we should change it, and uh, yeah. So a lot of misunderstandings that were corrected thanks to this process. All right. All right. Thank you. Maybe one last question. Oh no. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.